You thought you were watching Jeff, but it was me, Sandy! I'm here also. We're both here. It's a guest episode. So, yeah, I brought in my buddy Sandy the Papushi Rojas and her amazing singing voice to help me tackle one of the most memorable intros in recent years, Flyers, from the Madhouse original series Death Parade. Oh, I love Death Parade. The stories are all so touching, and the ending hits me right in the feels. Yeah, I cried more than a little. Not surprised looking at your Undertale review, and the Anohana thing, and your Lion April, and plastic memories. Hey, me crying is actually pretty rare. I just like talking about the stuff that makes it happen, is all. Uh Uh-huh. Anyway, did you know that a lot of the details of Death Parade's heart-wrenching conclusion are hidden in plain sight right in the OP? I did not. But do you know what all the flowers that show up in it mean? Actually, I don't. Looks like this is going to be a very informative episode. Also spoilery. Feel like I should warn you guys about that. Let's get on with it. Flyers kicks off with blaring trumpets. And with the Arbiter striking this totally freaking badass pose, I... Oh, <clears throat> which could be, you know, taken to represent how the characters fail to understand one another and end up going off in their own directions. <laughs> it's impressive just how much of each character's personality they manage to convey in this one image. Deckham is the most committed to the pose with his po face seriousness and his arm fully extended toward the heavens. Chiyuki seems unsure of what she's doing, like she's following everyone else's lead. Meanwhile, Ginty is displaying hilariously misplaced intensity, while Quinn barely even cares. There's an interesting contrast between the two characters on the floor, Oculus and Clavis. God's second-in-command is lounging about like he owns the place, which in a very real sense he does, and though he's barely exerting any effort, he still manages to command even more screen presence than the exuberantly cheerful elevator attendant. Oculus is also the only character looking directly into the camera, showing a greater awareness of how his universe works. Oh, and down at the bottom of the pile, you can see the skull that Castor wears, and immediately above it, Nona is looking super cute and having a great time, hinting at her playful nature. The position The positioning of her hands also resembles a common pose taken by the Buddha. A pose that'll come up later. At first, this transition appears to be a flurry of game pieces, but if you freeze frame, you see the organs that can be affected by them mixed in. Whoa, Jeff. Good eye. (laughs) (sighs) The way this shot is framed is pretty cool. The empty space on the right creates the expectation that company will be arriving. The well-lit bar on the left also serves to box Deckham and Chiyuki off in their own little world, a good way of establishing that the plot will mostly focus on them, but there's also a pillar between them, showing that they don't really understand each other. Also, the drink that Deckham mixes for Chiyuki is a memento mori, Latin for remember you will die, which is an important plot point in the last two episodes. Oh man, the halo around Deckham's head is super obvious here. How does anyone who comes to this bar not immediately recognize that they're in the afterlife? And here Quinn and Nona are getting absolutely sloshed in the bowling alley, which I guess makes sense given how drinking brings them together in the show. But they've had a lot. I mean, just look at the bottle scattered under the table. I'm a bit more interested in the background. The bar behind them is framed in pretty much the exact same way as the last shot, so maybe they're the guests that Deckham was waiting for. More importantly, Chiyuki skates by in her figure skating costume, straight out of the last episode. It might be a blink and you miss it thing, but that's a very big spoiler. Gives away the entire mystery of what her life as a human was like. Skating comes up once again following a montage of game pieces as Deckham presents a selection to us. Mixed in with props from the games that we see in the series are mahjong tiles, dice, a kendama, tops, and a pair of white figure skates. And behind them, there's that special Chavo roulette panel, with Chiyuki primed to hit the button. This fisheye shot of the bar creates a sense of being overwhelmed and disoriented as well, mirroring how Quindecum's guests often end up feeling upon arriving there. There's a bit of meaning in this chandelier, but we'll get to that when we see a better shot of it. In the meanwhile, I love the design of this DDR machine. It's converted from a Japanese funerary shrine, which usually has pictures of the deceased and incense on it instead of a TV, speakers, and dance pad. So, Nona is literally dancing on someone's grave. Yep, it's a delightfully morbid and ironic image that says a lot about the Arbiter's cavalier attitude toward life and death. The Buddha statue in the background, as well as the funeral arrangements around it, really tie it all together. You know, speaking of those, take a look at the flowers around the machine. Lily symbolize death, while the closed gentians, the, the little purple bulb things, mean sweet be your dreams, or rest in peace. The white chrysanthemums in the back represent a pure soul in Japanese culture, and Interestingly, the chrysanthemums is also a symbol of the Japanese emperor. It's pretty common to see all these flowers at Japanese funerals. Boy, this is so educational. 
Well, I know the significance of one other flower. Oculus's hairdo is a lotus, which is commonly used as a symbol of the Buddha. And if you want to talk about obvious religious imagery, the halo around his head is even more blatant. Not to mention the arms fanning out around him create a very godly impression. But which god is he? Kali? There are a lot of gods this could be alluding to, the Hindu deity Shiva, for example, but given the rest of the imagery we've seen and the hands clasped in prayer, I think it's safe to assume he's meant to evoke one of the multi-armed depictions of Buddha. Also, all of the ladies around him are cogs in the judgment system, in a metaphorical sense acting as his arms. His fingers point up and down, showing the two possible fates of Quindecum's guests. Quite a lot of meaning for what looks like just another fun dance move. This booty shake is a little less meaningful, though. And the following shot of Ginty taking off his shirt... Uh, Sandy? Mm. Huh? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I just, um, I was, uh, impressed by how his suspenders stayed on. I mean, like, you know, like one of those tablecloth trick things. But anyway, the burst of torn clothes, the red painting of a tree in the background, it all invokes Ginty's explosive intensity. Also, it's super cute how the cat jumps up to grab his button. I mean, if we're talking cute, Nona's little twirl here as the dance floor raises up behind her is straight up adorable. It also creates an impression not unlike a host or circus ringmaster, and she is the one that coordinates the little shows that the Arbiters put on. <sighs> but there isn't anything cuter than Quinn and Deckham dancing together. The jellyfish floating around them, a motif carried over from the Death Billiards OVA, can be taken to symbolize faith and acceptance of truth, or experiencing a breakthrough. There's a lot of ways that jellyfish can be interpreted, actually, but given the context- But seriously, look at how cute they are! Like, I'm- okay, look, listen. I really like the show, right? The story's great, the plot is great, I mean, Gindu's kinda hot, but, you know, them two together, it just always gets to me just how adorable they are, and it just- like, okay, so, like, I guess I have a thing for, like, guys with, like, blonde hair and whatever, but, um, oh, and- and by the way, Way. This pose right here is just super fan servicey and out of character. I mean, like, why would Ginty ever go along with that? I think it's mostly just meant to be fun, but Ginty is clearly pretty pissed about it. He still goes into this weird disco thing with the doll heads, though, but his eyes are cold and analytical, and you can see the silhouettes of the dolls representing his past guests. So, I suppose that's more true to its character. You know, that was probably the sweetest thing about the ending, how Ginty and Deckham both kept dolls representing their assistants close to the bar, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Mayu's facing us this time as she shakes her booty, and now she's surrounded by the twister color wheel that initially decided her fate. Behind her are symbols representing various characters, like Oculus's Lotus and Ginty's dolls. Clavis is having a great time dancing in front of his elevator, and when we open the doors, we see it's filled with dummies strung up in Deckham's web. A big part of Clavis Clavis's job is clearing these mannequins out of the elevator after their souls have vacated them. Actually, most of these shots are just showcasing the characters' jobs and personalities. Yeah, albeit in a pretty creative way, like Quinn juggling these bottles of booze, again showing us her vice. This is also the first glimpse we get of the information office, with the paintings on the wall representing memories of people's entire lives. It's a pretty cool area, and it's a shame that we don't see more of it in the show. These next few shots are almost pure fun. The guys join up in a can-can, Nona belts out a song on stage in front of the Death Parade logo, and the Arbiters ride around on a swing carousel hanging from the chandelier, and- Actually, now's a good time to point out the design of the chandelier. Oh? It's yet another jellyfish, in case anyone doubted the importance of that motif, and of course there are jellyfish tanks all around Quindecum. The chandelier is followed by two more group shots, the first of the guy smiling, or glaring, down at the camera, and the next of all the Arbiters crowded into the elevator with the void symbol over the entrance. Every cast member is visible in this shot, along with the few Arbiters who don't show up in the show itself. I like how pissed off Ginty is at Mayu for shoving her arm into his face. <laughs> The fact that it's the Void Elevator can be taken as an allusion to the origin of the Arbiters, cobbled together from countless human souls that have been cast into the Void. The next two shots largely amount to filler, albeit catchy, well-timed filler, but they bring us back from the fun to the actual meat of the OP. Here we see the painting of Chiyuki's memories rolling off the conveyor belt in information. Superimposed against it is the cover of Shavo, the book that was so important to her as a child. The book's themes are used throughout the show to riff on the importance and difficulty of understanding others and being understood, a struggle that ends up defining Chiyuki's arc. Oh, this scene with the birds is breathtaking. Also, it's lifted pretty much straight from the second to last episode, the scene right before Nona is confronted about her trickery by Oculus. 
Aight, so check it. Here's the big giveaway. An unconscious Chiyuki being lowered into Deckham's arms on thread. Another scene taken from the show right before he brings her down to the bottom level. This gives away pretty much right off the bat that Chiyuki is already dead and Deckham will have to judge her. The elevators behind them kind of emphasize that too. In a broader sense, I think the repeated image of mannequins suspended from strings is meant to hint that Deckham is more of a puppeteer than a judge and a lot of the darkness that he finds in people's souls is something that he puts there. In this last pose, both of their fingers point upward, foreshadowing that Chiyuki Yuki will be reincarnated, and that the two characters will eventually come to see eye to eye, even if they couldn't understand each other at first. That's emphasized by the pan down to the two frayed Chavot dolls in Chiyuki's hands. Their positions mirror Deckham and Chiyuki's, as does their closeness. As a touching final send-off, the end credits of the last episode use a variant of this shot with Chiyuki replaced by a dummy, and the same dummy is placed next to Deckham's bar, showing that he'll always remember her. Now, with the OP finished... Although if you do want to stick around here, we've got plenty of other great OP analyses, including an upcoming breakdown of One Punch Man. And I recently started doing game reviews with the same level of depth as what's in an OP, so if you like video games, and who doesn't, check those out too. The first review is of Undertale, and I couldn't be prouder of how it turned out, so please give it a watch, especially if you've played the game already and want new reasons to love it. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter for regular updates about the channel, and follow my Steam Curator page if you want to see other games I think you ought to play. And well, you're at it, stop by my Twitch channel for regular League of Legends games and other fun stuff. This is Sandy Rojas, professional Fujoshi. Along with Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.